We have a monthly newsletter. You can get a link to that either on the website or in the Friday email blast that comes out if you're on the list to get those emails. Um, and you can join our virtual community on Facebook as well. We begin our gathering acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, language, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Today, on the cusp of Remembrance Day, we honor the sacrifices of Indigenous people from every region of Canada who served in the armed forces during the Second World War, fighting in every major battle and campaign of the conflict. To serve their country, Indigenous people had to overcome many cultural challenges. Their courage, sacrifices, and accomplishments are a continuing source of pride to their families, their communities, and to all Canadians. Announcements. Now, I believe Gordon has an announcement, and so does Marilyn, and for that matter, so do I, but Gordon first. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gordon Ritchie. My pronouns are he, him. I have a very exciting announcement because it involves food. Next Sunday, we're having a soup Sunday. Uh, there, I know, how exciting is that? So um, there is a sign-up sheet in the lobby. I'm going to be coordinating this event. Um, so do sign up. We need lots of people to help with this. Uh, we will need people for uh, setting up, people to bring soup, buns, sweets, and sides, uh, desserts as well. Uh, also um, for cleanup as well would be greatly appreciated. So that's next Sunday. Um, also. Uh, we are looking for someone to take on the role of coordinator for Soup Sundays. We have another event that's coming up in December, um, and Marilyn Gay has very pleased. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to thank Marilyn for for uh, stepping up to be the coordinator for that one. But the church is looking for someone who's going to be um, available and interested in taking on the role of coordinator for the Soup Sundays. It's a wonderful event for our community. So next Sunday, Soup Sunday, please sign up in the lobby. Thank you. Hello, I'm Marilyn Gay and my pronouns are she, her. The uh, December event that Gordon alluded to is Blue Christmas. It's not a Sunday, it's a Tuesday actually. And um, we'll be looking for lots of uh, contributors and also participants because it's a day when the uh, la 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 of the Christmas season just hits a sour note for some people. But today my announcement is something different. As you probably figured out from all the poppies people are wearing, white ones that have peace in the center of the petals and also the traditional red ones. Tomorrow is Remembrance Day and there's an event that you can attend. Um, the uh, Quaker and Mennonite communities have organized an event at Churchill Square at 1.30. And I'll just read from the poster their own words, reflecting through song, word, and silence. They say, 2024 has been a year of unbelievable war, destruction, and oppression. As we lament continued injustice and violence, come and join our voices in solidarity as we pray and work for a just peace in our shared world. So, dress warmly, come out to Churchill Square, at 1.30, and you can be part of this very meaningful event. I would like to make an announcement about the Unitarian Church of Edmonton Endowment Fund. It's your way to make a difference now and in the future. It's a way to offer a tribute 
to those whose works and memories we admire and cherish. Should you wish to honor someone significant in your life or simply help build a legacy of the UCE, updated endowment brochure, uh, endowment fund brochures and envelopes can be found at the back of the church. An article in the November newsletter also provides information. Any of the endowment trustees, Jan McMillan, no, okay, <laughs> sorry, Ruth Marriott, or myself, John Turvey, will be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Let's plan to give. Please take a moment to quiet any devices and let's enjoy a time of quiet contemplation and music with this prelude by Gordon Ritchie, Love by David Foster. Thank you so much, Gordon, that was beautiful. Now I would like to invite Tony Wong to come forward to light our chalice. Tony is one of the newest members of our community. Um, I'm going to read these words while Tony lights the channel, these are chalice by Reverend Maureen Killerin. Welcome, you who come in need of healing, you who are confused or have been betrayed, welcome with your problems and your pain. Welcome to your joys and your wonderings. Welcome your need to hope, your longing for assurance. Instead of answers, here may you find safety for your questions. Instead of promises, may you find community for your struggles. People with hands and hearts to join you in engaging the challenges and changes of the day. Our opening hymn is number 168 in the gray hymnal, One More Step. The text will appear on the screen behind me, and I invite you to rise as you, as you are willing and able.
In acknowledgement of Remembrance Day tomorrow, I'd like to read the beloved poem written during the First World War by Canadian physician, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up the quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. And now it's time to share the abundance we are so privileged to enjoy. Uh, we have two volunteers ready to circulate the offering plates. Thank you very much. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life of this congregation. May we give in love and hope. If you wish to receive a tax receipt for your gift, you can use the envelopes found on the table at the back of the sanctuary. Please ensure you provide your contact information. Many of our members and friends give monthly or annually through automatic withdrawal from their accounts. <clears throat> In addition to supporting this community, we also make a monthly commitment to the wider community. One half of the unidentified cash received is given to an outside organization, and for the month of November, we are supporting the Edmonton Food Bank. The Food Bank provides food for about 40,000 people each month through its hamper programs and over 400,000 meals and snacks monthly through partner soup kitchens, shelters, schools, and other community groups. UCE is one of those partners, serving as a depot for hamper pickups. Volunteers organized by Susan Vatan work here every Wednesday evening to distribute the hamper to families and individuals who've registered. Those joining us online are encouraged to go to the Edmonton Food Bank website to donate. I know they'll appreciate it. And now please join in singing from you I receive as the offering is brought forward. <laughs> Well, in thinking about the service reflection for this morning, I struggle to settle on just one thing. We have Remembrance Day, the monthly service theme on living love through the practice of repair, and then, of course, the bombshell U.S. election results. Should I choose one, two, or can I weave those together in some way? <laughs> I think so, <laughs> and I'm going to give it a shot. My father was a World War II veteran. He didn't talk much about his experience, not a lot anyway, but when he did, it was about the bravery, stoicism, and the deep uh, connection he shared with his comrades in arms. That's when I would see the tears well up. It was, those were actually moments of repair, of healing for him, I think. As Amy Green tells us, it's not forgetting that heals, it's remembering. That's what we are called to do every November 11th. And Remembrance Day continues to heal our collective consciousness, something that simply forgetting about those sacrifices would not achieve. 
Dad was good at repairing other things too. Being uh, raised on a farm and becoming a farmer himself, he was imbued with a resourcefulness that the whole family benefited from. I still use my mother's old Dutch oven, a strong, sturdy pot. It's still growing, going strong after 60 some years. About 40 years ago, because of all that lovely home cooking, the handle fell off of the lid. Well, dad repaired that by using uh, an empty wooden thread spool. It's still on there and I still use it. And I will not uh, replace that Dutch oven with a newer, fancier model because of the love I knew that went into repairing it. Let's remember that about the worth of people too in this often throwaway culture. Dad was helpful with neighbors as well, just as was the custom in a small southern Alberta community. Like most of his neighbors, he was a conservative, but not the Take Back Alberta Daniel Smith brand. He fought for Canada, not just Alberta. And I think he would have been appalled at what happened in Tuesday's US election, at the division being fueled by the MAGA crowd. As his daughter and a Unitarian member, I am also appalled and distraught at the polarization and the nastiness displayed and the possible impacts to Canada and the global community. And I just lost my last page. lost my last page. Okay, I, I, I'm just going to wing it. Yeah. I think that we have to remember if we want to help repair the fractions that, um, that threaten us, the fraction here and the fractures here and across the border, we have to remember, well, here we are, just in time. There it is. <laughs> there it is, and I, I was right. A good start could be to remember and remind others wherever possible of our shared humanity, our interdependent web of existence as our seventh principle states. What we do as individuals and as a Unitarian community will have impacts, not just for our neighbors across the street, but for our neighbors across the border too. Because of that interconnectedness, our collective consciousness, the butterfly effect, if you will, how a small flutter of hope can invoke the, the winds of positive change. No, this is not a Pollyanna moment. I truly believe that remembering and acting on our sixth principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, helps to keep our inner lights bright, shining through the cracks of our common humanity. It will make a difference. And now I believe we hopefully have a video, a meditation video. I'm not sure if we were able to get that going. Uh, yeah. Oh, I hear one moment. Oh, The Japanese Bowl by Peter Mayer. Beautiful music by Peter Mayer.
that'll probably help up there if I turn on my mic. How's that? Is it coming through now? Okay, I'll try to speak up. I don't have a whole lot of voice, but we'll uh, we're gonna do our best. Thank you for that wonderful reflection. Thank you for all your everything that you've done to, for the service. Thank you for being here on this uh, holiday weekend, uh, which isn't really a holiday though, is it, when we think about Remembrance Day and all that that means. Um, my father too served overseas in the Second World War. He was, um, he was the wireless operator on the front and he was part of the, um, his big um, pride in the Second World War is that he was from the 8th Reconnaissance, uh, the Saskatchewan 8th Reconnaissance, and they were part of the liberating troops uh, in, in Holland. And that was something that he, he talked about a lot, was how, how, the, how the Dutch people embraced the Canadian troops and were so happy to see them. And one of the stories he told was that the, they, were, they were told to keep the tanks moving, like as they went through the streets in Amsterdam, they had to keep the tanks moving, they were told. So they couldn't keep the tanks moving. We couldn't move at all. There were people and children right in front of the tanks and all over the tanks and we were being swarmed. So it was a real source of pride for him. And, there, and like um, Lynn's dad, he came back needing repair. They were, but they weren't to talk about it uh, very much. And so not like now when people are get um, um, come back traumatized from anything. There's some critical incident stress debriefing and that kind of thing that happens. I digress. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome and my name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison. It's my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation. And um, the topic that I've chosen to speak about on the, on the topic of repair is life is all about repair. But I'll back up a little bit, and something that I've always said is that life is actually all about relationships. That's the only thing that's actually important in life is relationships. And how do we build relationships? How do we get to a healthy relationship? Who's ever been in a relationship? Are you, are you a parent, a sibling, an aunt, an uncle? A, a, um, yeah, so we've all kind of been children, so we've had parents or surrogate parents of some kind. We've got siblings, so we've all been in some kind of a relationship. And so what, who can tell me what are some of the components, perhaps, of a, a healthy relationship? Go ahead and just shout out two or three things. Trust, laughter, one from over here. Communication, respect, okay, that's good. Compromise, all right. I don't know, not in my house. <laughs> My way, no, I'm kidding. That's totally, totally a joke. So, and what, what do you think might be something that would harm the relationship? Any ideas? What kind of thing would you bring to a relationship? You are, not you, of course, but someone else might bring to a relationship that could cause harm. Disrespect, so fear that there's only one way to do things, lack of compromise. <laughs> John is agreeing with, yeah, maybe there is just one way to do things. <laughs> and of course, if you're online, please feel free to, have, to put things in the chat around this and then to comment on each other's comments. That makes it a little bit more interesting if you're uh, online. So kind of the opposite of the things that are good about relationship building, right? Healthy relationships, fear. Trust and fear, compromise only one way, right? Mental health, yeah. We, so when we begin a relationship, it's just kind of all about, you know, getting to know one another and it feels really good and, and you go for walks and, and do all the kinds of things and, and we find out all the things that we have in common. Oh, I love this kind of movie and that kind of music and it's just all... It's all pretty wonderful at the beginning of a relationship, but it's also a little bit, a little bit shallow. It doesn't, the trust doesn't get built and we don't go deeper until what happens? Some kind of upset, some kind of argument, some kind of like, oh, 
the ro bloom comes off the rose. Oh, I thought that we would agree on that. Oh, oh, we do have differences. Hmm. Now what are we going to do? Hmm. So last spring in February, I went to Parksville to, in a collegial gathering, and we, um, we studied the book On Repentance and Repair by Daniel Ruttenberg. And I'm going to have to have my water closer, but I don't have any way to do that. Okay. Um, and I was really happy to see in the Soul Matters packet this month that there was quite a bit of, uh, of her work in there, in there. And, and, it, um, and it really helped me kind of decide what I was going to talk about this, this week as we dive into repair. You know, I've made some mistakes this week. Well, I, I make mistakes every day, interestingly enough. Um, but, and, and who never makes a mistake on any given day? Can I have a hand? No, there's some, okay, we can talk, we, we, are those people that raise their hands, I'd like you to make appointments with me, please. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. I us hope to get through this without a coughing fit. And I, you know, I made some mistakes this week, and I actually made some of the similar, a similar mistake uh, there are two, two of the people in this, in this room that I've made similar mistakes with, with a similar mistake. And, and so as I was reading through the process of repair, I decided that I would go about repairing or fixing it for, at least for me, in a little bit of a different way. I, de I de went back and I fixed the problem that caused the mistake in the first place. It wasn't earth shattering, but in doing it, I realized that I had been too flippant and, and not careful enough. And, and then I wrote an apology that encompassed several aspects of what I want to talk about this morning. So let's talk, let's begin with a quote from Dania Ruttenberg's book on repentance and repair. The work of repentance all the way through is the work of transformation. The work of repentance is all the way through to the work of transformation. Hang on to that word, transformation. It's the work of facing down false stories and engaging with painful reality. It's the work of being open to seeing ourselves as we really are, of understanding that other people's needs and pain are at least as important, if not more so, than our own. It's about trying to figure out how to be the kind of person who sees others suffering and takes responsibility for any role we might have had in causing it. It's about ownership, owning who we have been and what we have done, and owning the person that we are be capable of becoming. And that's the line that I just, when we think about transformation, owning the person that we are capable of becoming. The work of repair isn't just about mending a relationship or getting back to just getting along. It's transformational. And what does she mean by that? In, in the process of repair, we need to look deeply within ourselves. Why did we do that? What, did, what is it about us that allowed us to say something so hurtful when we look back on it? If we want to do actual, authentic repair, the idea is that we have to take time to finish the thoughts and examine our intentions. And perhaps if we're lucky enough, we might encounter some hurt that we've been carrying around with us, and we, then we can bring it to the light and then release it. This is transformational work. Being in a relationship of any kind means that we are going to mess up, make up, and carry on. And how we do that is important, according to the experts. How many have heard about um, the Gottman Institute or about the Gottmans? I talk about them fairly regularly because I think they're brilliant. And I use their work in my everyday life. They, they talk about things like bids. So when I ask you a question and you respond to it, you're responding to my bid in a favorable way, and that builds our relationship, right? But if I ask you a question and you don't respond, 
it makes I'm like then I'll kind of get flustered and I won't know what to do next and it will harm our relationship and the same is true for any relationship their life work has been to look deeply at relationships uh, primarily in primary relationships with romantic or partnered couples and they developed this love lab in well, Seattle Washington and uh, here is a quote from an article that I found on the Gottman website. When you think about it, and this can be extrapolated or applied to every single relationship, it's not just about intimate partner couples, right? If you're single, this still applies. When you think about it, every couple in every relationship is set up for failure. It's impossible to be emotionally available to your partner 100% of the time. It's not possible. And in his book, The Science of Trust, Dr. Gottman explains that both partners in a relationship are emotionally available only about 9% of the time. So that's what their studies have concluded, is that we are only available, emotionally available, to our partners about 9% of the time. And that leaves 91% of the time in our communication for misunderstanding with our partners. But failure is not the problem, they say. Even a parent that maybe gets it right 50% of the time can raise a child to be a healthy, functioning, well-functioning adult with healthy relationships. And the difference between what they call good parents and bad parents, and I would personally question those labels, according to Donald Winnicott, is not the commission of errors, but what they do with them. How a child copes with everyday failures and fluctuations is directly related to the degree in which their parent creates an environment for a secure attachment and how, that, and how the parent repairs the errors. This is no different in our romantic relationships or any relationships. The difference between people that are happy in a relationship and those that are not is that it's not that they don't make mistakes because we all make mistakes I've made a few real good ones already today how couples repair is what separates what they call the relationship masters from the disasters I thought that was kind of cute repair is the key to relationship success and no matter how careful we are in our relationships we are inv invariably going to rupture the bond and even in a good relationship, we're going to say mean things to one another. We're going to yell at each other, hopefully not too loud and not too long. And we're going to get critical and defensive. It's hard not to get defensive. It's hard not to get defensive. And we're going to engage in stonewalling. That's something that I used to do quite regularly. Ask my daughter. They all do the same things unhealthy couples do. So healthy couples and unhealthy couples all do the same things because we're just human and we all make mistakes. But at some point, they have a conversation where they recover from it. The difference between the masters and the disasters of relationships is the masters repair their interactions effectively. These couples are willing to admit responsibility for their part in the conflict so that they can begin the process of healing their bond. They realize their relationship is more important than the problem. And I think that's where compromise comes in, and realizing that there is no just one right way. So Dania Rittenberg's, Rittenberg's book is basically a riff off of the book um, Mishnah Torah by uh, rabbi, philosopher, astronomer, physician, Moses Maimonides. In, in, he, in his work, he lays out very specific steps for the process of, of, um, of repair, including confession, public confession of harm, making amends, and the deep transformational work that culminates in changed actions. The apology, though important, is not central. In fact, in the five steps, the apology is step four, which kind of surprised me. 
caring for someone that is hurt is a given. So in, in the 12th century, um, he was born in Cordoba, Spain, and um, he was actually the um, personal physician of Saladin, which is kind of interesting. He was like this really kind of brilliant, interesting person. Um, so I was like, why is it so late in the process? Why are they asking for an, why is the apology happening so late in the process? And the reason that Maimonides talks about is that the work has to be done before the apology can happen. Otherwise, the apology is going to be shallow and could perhaps be full of defensiveness and things like, well, I'm, you know, I'm sorry you're so upset, but, you know, most people wouldn't be, you know, that kind of thing. And so instead of it being a true ap apology before the work has been done, it can just harm right on over again. Maimonides suggests that we don't just get to mess up, mumble, I'm sorry, and get on with our lives. He suggests that we are not, we do not deserve forgiveness until we have gone through the steps, until we have done the work of repair. And then he suggests, maybe not even then. So let's look briefly at these five steps, naming and owning the harm. And in 12th century um, Spain, um, the idea was that this would be done in the public square. We don't need to do that. We don't need to stand up and get a microphone and say, I have harmed, I've done something wrong. But saying it out loud is important and naming it is important. So in that naming, we say what the impact is, but the, um, and it could have been very different than our intention, and that doesn't matter. If the harm's been done, the harm's been done, no matter if our intention was not to harm. An apology and work is still required. And so step two is called starting to change. Uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of, when we come up with a similar situation. So in the, the big mistake that I made um, was uh, I'm moving from a digital, from, from paper day timer to digital day timer on my phone. Uh, but I decided I was smart enough that I could have both of them going at the same time, but I'm not, absolutely not. And so I missed an appointment. Um, and so what I did, rather than just say, oh darn, and feel sorry for myself, um, I went to my paper day timer and took out my computer and I made sure that they matched for the rest of the year. Now that's something I might not have done if I hadn't just been studying the uh, Dania Ruttenberg's work. So if we come up against a similar situation, so we're starting to change, if we come up against a similar situation, we say, okay, this is similar to what I've done and now before, and now I've learned that I shouldn't do that, so I'm gonna do something better. So we might not this time blame the victim or say something like, sorry, you feel that way, but it was kind of normal, don't you think? We wouldn't say that again. We wouldn't take something without asking. We would try harder to use the correct pronouns for someone. The idea is that if we don't do the work, we'll just keep making the same mistakes over and over that cause pain and harm. So in order to make these changes, we need to do some self-examination, grapple with our, with the things that made us do those things in the first place. And she uses the example of Harper's apology to the First Nations people. We apologize, but then we continue to exploit. That was her example, and, and she goes on in great length about it. Step three is restitution and accepting consequences. So in the other steps, Maimonides is working with the perpetrator, and here he begins to work with the victim. So restitution could be perhaps paying back something that was taken. Um, perhaps it is, um, I don't know, maybe going to rehab if that was part of the problem or to therapy or something. Restitution 
is always negotiated, not imposed. So restitution would be worked out between the two or three or four or whomever. And step four, finally, is the apology. All this work happens according to Maimonides, and it doesn't need to take like four weeks. It could happen fairly quickly, I don't know. It would be up to you and the person that you're with. But until, the, until that work is done, those apology words could be shallow and meaningless according to this. So he suggests that we don't know what we're apologizing, apologizing for until we have done all these steps. And if we can't truly apologize if we haven't examined the problem within ourselves that caused the transgression in the first place. And finally, we get to step five, making different choices. If we haven't done a good job with the process, if, pardon me, if we've done a good job of the, of the process, we found out some interesting things about ourselves, haven't we? I found out some interesting things about myself. I'm too careless. I don't pay any attention to detail. And I need to really work on that. So perhaps through this process, we have learned to be more open, less vague, more, less guarded, more loving, more willing to become authentic and vulnerable more willing to shed some of our masks that we all have, each and every one of us. The beautiful thing is, though, that we are owning up to the person we are capable of becoming. We are owning up to the person we are capable of becoming. We can't become, we can't become our best selves until we do the personal work that it takes to genuinely repair transgressions. We can say to ourselves, I've been so afraid of doing this work because I didn't want to admit my flaws or my shortcomings. I've been really trying to have like a show how, how great I am and so I don't want you to see any of my vulnerabilities, any of the beautiful gold-filled cracks, right? But growing through this process can teach us that we are stronger than we think we are and that we're capable of building strong and beautiful relationships. We can't ever go back or undo things in time, but we can go forward and repair our relationships and improve our well-being. We, we can continue to do harm or we can decide to make better choices. Repentance, says Rettenberg, is like the Japanese art of kintsugi, repairing broken pottery with gold. We can't unbreak what we've broken, but with the sincere and deep work of transformation, acts of repair have the potential to make something beautiful and new. After reading Rettenberg's book, I was curious about what the experts are saying about what a complete apology in the 21st century might look at, look like. So I looked at um, Harvard Health Publishing, December 21st, 2023, and uh, a short article by Julie Corliss. I won't read the whole thing. And um, they say that there's four parts to an apology. And see if you can see some of the similarities. Acknowledge the offense. Take responsibility, whether it was physical or psychological harm and confirm that your behavior was not acceptable. Avoid being vague or wording an apology that minimizes the offense. It, explain what happened. The, the, the challenge here is to explain it without making excuses. So they say, don't make any excuses. Express remorse. If you regret the error or feel ashamed or humiliated, say so. If you feel regret, ashamed, or humiliated, say so. Offer to make amends. If you've damaged someone's property, offer to replace it, that kind of thing. So as you can see, my did anybody see some similarities between the 12th century and wherever we are now? That was just uh, less than a year ago. He wasn't very far off in, in this work, 
um, a brilliant man, obviously. And, uh, and as we work through this month of repair, um, what can repair mean in our own lives? There's some more opportunities through the rest of this month to continue to work on this. Um, there's the Soul Matters packet that is available to you. The link is in every email that comes out. Um, there's also car, um, copies on the back of the table, on the table in the foyer for you to take. So take some of those home and read through. There's some really neat stuff in there. Podcasts, videos, music articles, all that kind of, it's a really rich resource that we offer to you every month. You can have a look at those. Next Sunday, we'll be doing some activities, some fun, fam, some fun activities um, around the practice of repair, and we'll be sitting at tables again. So come back for that. It should be fun. Well, I think it's going to be fun. I'll try to make it fun. And um, then s Sunday evening is a Vesper service again here at 7.30, um, and we will focus in on the practice of repair, and so a time of reflection and contemplation. And as we kind of move into um, our time of meditation, contemplation, and reflection, I would like to invite you to just take a few moments, center yourselves, and feel your feet on the floor. Take a few deep breaths. Allow that chair that you are sitting in to hold you. Can you feel it? Can you rest into it? Can you let some of your muscles go, knowing that you are held? You are held here. You are held in love. I invite you to focus in on your breath and follow it as it goes in through your nose and down into your whole body, nurturing and supporting every cell in your being. Take a few moments of silence. As we think about and focus in on practice of repair, that this take stock of our bodies and note where there's tension, do a little scan, know that you are welcome, you are loved, you belong, and you're just like everyone else, make mistakes. genuinely a good person. And it is through the practice of repair that we can become our best selves. I'm going to take another moment of silence after which Gordon is going to bring us into our meditation hymn 1037, We Begin Again in Love, written by the Reverend Rob Eller Isaacs. There is words that I will say, and then music that you will sing. The words will come up on the screen in, in screen in just a moment.
difference. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible, have struck out in anger without just cause. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others. the selfishness that set us apart and alone. <coughs> For falling short of the admonitions of the Spirit. losing sight of our unity. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which have fueled the illusion of separateness. Each Sunday, we light candles of care and concern, care and connection, whatever is the, whatever you would like to call them. But what they signify is the fact that we're human, that we make mistakes, that we have joys, that we have celebrations, that we have heartache, that we have people in our lives that we care about. And so each Sunday, we light a candle, we light candles to make them real, make, bring them to life, allow them to breathe and to acknowledge that we are human and that we are full of love and we are full of light. The tables are ready, I invite you to, as you wish, to light a candle of joy, care, concern, or connection.
Lynn is lighting a last candle for all of those joys and concerns and connections that we wish to make that maybe have been ruptured. The repair in our lives, the joy in our lives, all of these things. It's really beautiful to look at the candles and see the candelabras full and shining, each light representing something that we humans hold dear. I just love it. It makes me so happy. I think, are we uh, back to the regularly scheduled programming? Oh, I am going to announce the last hymn. We are building a new way, hymn number 1017. And I hope that through the, this um, look at Dania Ruttenberg's work, we can see that we are indeed building a new way together. We're building stronger and more beautiful relationships between ourselves uh, here at the congregation level, out there in online world and in our homes and places of work with our families. So, Rise as you are willing and able and sing with me the last hymn, Building a New Way. I invite Tony Wong to come forward to extinguish the chalice as I read these words by Reverend Scott Taylor, offering anchors of calm. When the winds on your path begin to swirl, you may find your breath. May you find your breath, I'm sorry. May you remember and return to that still point inside that is always waiting to welcome you back home. And from that place of empowering peace, may you be an anchor of calm for those who need it as much as you. Well, I didn't have a coughing fit all the whole time through, so I'm pretty happy about that. I am so grateful to each and every one of you for being here this morning, to the tech crew, coffee makers, service leaders, thank you, musician, Gordon, thank you, to everyone that contributed to this service, both today and the week ahead, the week behind it. Lots and lots of work goes into it. Stay for coffee and visit with one another as well after the service and get to get to put into practice some of these things that we have learned. And above all, do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break and things can be mended, but not with, it, with time, as they say, with intention. So go 
and love intentionally and love extravagantly and love unconditionally for the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is within you. And don't forget that the light shines brightest through the gold of the cracks of the vessel. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. Amen. Let us sing our linking song, Carry the Flame, as we end our time together this morning. <laughs>